اليهودي على أيدي الناس عملاً This is a recording from last year from Ikra, a Saudi-funded TV station widely shown in Muslim countries. Many Israelis see such pictures as conclusive evidence as to why they can never trust the peaceful intentions of their Muslim neighbours. To some Muslims, Basmala is merely reciting the words of the Holy Quran, words that confirm the justness of their struggle against the treacherous Jews. And this is only one of myriad examples I've found of overt anti-Semitism in the Arab world. The Jews are worse than Hitler. The Jews invented the myth of the Holocaust to gain sympathy. The Jews were behind 9-11. The Jews spread AIDS and other diseases. The Jews murder babies in bizarre rituals. The Jews have a secret conspiracy for world domination. So try all the time to say that Holocaust, 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 in order to justify that uh, they come to Palestine. I'm David Aronovich, and tonight I'm on a journey to explore the phenomenon of Muslim anti-Semitism. My search takes me from its roots in medieval Christendom to the heart of the Islamic world. My question is this. Is this hatred of the Jews primarily the result of Israel's policy towards the Palestinians or a sinister import from Europe, translating the Nazi project to a new theatre in the Middle East? Fabric is no peace with the Jews. This is Sheikh Faisal, the British Muslim cleric involved in one of this year's most extraordinary court cases. The Jews are deceitful by nature. Accused of preaching race hate from a North London mosque, Faisal had called for a holy struggle, a jihad, against Jews, Hindus and Americans. And how do you fight Jews? You kill the Jews. The Jews can't afford to die because they have only three million in Israel, occupied Palestine. Tapes like these led to the unprecedented charge of soliciting murder along with incitement to racial hatred. A law intended to protect minorities applied for the first time not to a neo-Nazi group, but to a Muslim cleric trained in Saudi Arabia. The Sheikh's defense was based on the Quran. Surah 2, verse 190 commands the faithful to fight those who fight against you, a plea of self-defense. The topic, no peace with the Jews, it's a topic which every Muslim will have to believe in, that they will not be, there won't be any peace in the Middle East. You cannot be a Muslim and contradict the Prophet Muhammad. As he traveled to the Old Bailey, his wife Zubayda by his side, Faisal hoped the jury would accept his argument that he had merely been calling for Muslims to resist the Israeli aggressor in Palestine. I never dreamed that one day the tapes would be played in the Old Bailey and the jury would decide, is he a cleric or a criminal? <laughs> Those who hate Muslims most to be the Jews. So if they hate you, why do you want to love them? You have no choice but to hate them. In the view of his supporters gathered outside the court, the Sheikh had simply reiterated the words of God as given to the Prophet in the Quran. And when the court sentenced Faisal to nine years in jail for soliciting murder, their anger was apparent. The Quran is on trial, the Hadith is on trial, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, stands convicted today from preaching from the Quran. The Sheikh was condemned by most British Muslim leaders, but the arguments outside the court still suggested something worrying that some Muslims were choosing to read anti-Semitism into the Quran. Despite what you want to do, what you want to say, despite what you put on the TV, Islam is the world's fastest growing religion. 
But was Faisal's quarrel with all Jews or just with those in Israel? With the sheikh now in Belmarsh jail awaiting an appeal, I talked to his wife Zubaydah about his seemingly bizarre tapes. It's a Muslim-Israeli conflict and it is compulsion on you to waste jihad, to liberate it from the hands of the filthy Jews. What? Did your husband, in his sermon, refer so often to the filthy Jew? I think um, that's to do with the backdrop of Palestine, okay? Because if you see that how Palestinians for 50 years have been persecuted every day, I mean, um, even the British people in this country would feel that way if the Romans came over and claimed Britain as their land. So it's injustice towards the Palestinians. It's their land, and Jews have taken it over using the Bible, the Torah. But he uses this expression all the time, and given the context of the sermon which we've just been talking about, which is what the words of the prophet are, uh, he's not talking just about Palestine. He's talking about Jews almost over an eternity, and he describes them as the filthy Jew. The filth, they would have been filthy before 1948 and the establishment of Israel. No, 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 that's not how it is. They've only just it's, become filthy. <laughs> no, he's talking about the belief system, OK? Uh, if you read what the Talmud says, uh, the Talmud says they can rape three-year-old girls it, of the... It doesn't. It does say that. It doesn't say that. Have you read the Talmud? I know it doesn't say that. Oh, you haven't read No, no, no. What it says is it's that three-year-old girls who are raped cannot be considered to have consented and to have therefore be, and therefore not to be virgins anymore. That's what it says. They, I have a documentary saying um, the other side of Israel... And in it, it gives you references, which rabbi said in which part of the Talmud. And large sections of these, because I've had them looked up, are actually just fabrications. Well, they're, not, they're not true. And some of these books which are quoted don't exist. Some don't, of the, the teachers that are supposed to don't exist either. I don't believe you, because uh, why would they produce such a documentary quoting, quoting these statements? And also we have consulted the people who have done PhD in this... Uh, what, what kind of people would those be? These are the scholars. Um, where? They're not Muslims. Maybe you should go and ask the Jews themselves. There are so many in Golders Green. Who owns the sun? Rupert Murdoch. Who is he? A Jew from where? Australia. In what way are Jews behind the media? One of the things that your husband does is claim that Rupert Murdoch is a Jew, but he's not. Well, he's, he is, because uh, isn't that man Robert Maxwell his father? No. Oh, well, we thought he was. No, he's got nothing to do with him. They're not related at all. And Rupert Murdoch is not in any way Jewish. Oh, is it? Murdoch's a Scottish name, and uh, at some point or other they went to Australia. I see. I think so. Well, I thought he was an Australian Jew. No. OK. But doesn't that kind of illustrate a problem, which is you say that the media is controlled by the Jews and you make people who aren't Jews Jewish in order to prove the case? But sometimes the Jews, they hide their identity. That's what the Zionists do. Sometimes they hide their identity, and only when they're de dead, and then they have the funeral, you'll see he's a Jew. Wherever they go in any country, they try to take it over and try to morally just um, subvert the culture of that country. Where, uh, whichever country the Jews go to, they try no, and subvert the it. No, the Zionists. The Zionists. That's right. It was hard not to be amazed by the words of Zubaydah, but the scary thing was her invocation of the Quran in support of her husband's views. If the Allah of the Quran was a Jew hater, then no good Muslim could be anything else. This is pretty tough on non-Muslims in some ways. Believers take neither the Jews nor the Christians for your friends. The idea is that the Jews and the Christians have both refused to see the final revelation to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and then God gets angry with them and says, Shall I tell you who will receive a worse reward from God, says Muhammad, those whom God has cursed and with whom he has been angry, transforming them into apes and swine. But you just turn over a page um, and then all of a sudden the tone softens and the good people, good Christians, good Jews, believers, Jews, Sabaeans, whatever they are, and Christians, whoever believes in God on the last day and does what's right shall have nothing to fear or to regret. So you can see how if you're a soft, kind-hearted imam, you can find things in there to say, no, these people are not all our enemies and we can live with them. And you can see how on a certain interpretation, some other imam can say, no, these people are our implacable enemies and we must confront them. It seems that some Muslims are choosing to focus on the Quran's occasional diatribe against the Jews. But is this just junk religion or is it accepted by serious Muslim scholars? I asked a respected writer on Islam, Adil Salahi, if he agreed the Quran was disparaging about Jews. On the contrary, Islam 
considers Judaism as a divine message given to one of God's most honored prophets and messengers. What is all this apes and pigs stuff? Well, in the Quran, God says that because they violated the Sabbath, he said to them, be like apes. Well, it means that they were driven by their desire to violate the law of God. They actually became slaves to their desire in the, in the same way as animals are. But unfortunately, some people take it literally and carry the... They were driven by their desire to violate the law of God, they actually became slaves to their desire in the, in the same way as animals are. But unfortunately, some people take it literally and carry the metaphor or the image into uh, the modern world. So why is it that some in Islam now choose to be so much less tolerant? For inspiration, they only had to look as far as Christian Europe where Jews had, for centuries, been paying the price for the crucifixion of Christ. I travelled to Lincoln, the 13th century home to a small, prosperous Jewish community. I was there to discover the origins of the blood libel, the accusation that Jews used the blood of non-Jews in ritual sacrifice. Here in Lincoln Cathedral is the shrine of little St. Hugh. Hugh was found dead at the bottom of a well in 1255. Local Christians claimed the Jews had murdered the boy and extracted his blood for their Passover ceremony. Pilgrims could touch either an effigy of the child or um, something to do with him and be associated uh, with uh, this child's uh, sacrifice at the hands of the wicked Jews. In 1290, all Jews were expelled from England. But the blood libel had spread throughout Europe. Countless Jews died because of it. And, as I was to discover, it's become one of the most pernicious gifts the Christians passed on to the Muslim world. Centuries later, the blood libel was to mutate into another myth, perhaps even more devastating for the Jewish people. Right, protocols of the meeting of the learned elders of Zion, translated from the Russian text by Victor E. Marsden. This strange document, the Protocols, purported to be a master plan for Jewish world domination, except it was a blatant forgery, a concoction of the Russian secret police. The latter work purports to contain minutes of certain secret meetings of the elders of Zion, uh, which were laid bare the aim and purposes of the general headquarters of the Jewish nation for the conquest and enslavement of the entire world. Millions in Europe came to believe this stuff. There's an almost direct line from the Protocols to the Holocaust. The protocols, the blood libel, an anti-Jewish interpretation of the Quran, are these the signs of a new anti-Semitism? Once an appalling European problem, next we'll find out if it's become an Arab one. Now it gets a lot more serious. I'm on the road from Jordan to Israel, passing through the occupied West Bank and the Judean desert. It's a critical time here. This place is on a war footing, but now with a slim chance of peace. Two years of intifada have fueled anti-Jewish rhetoric, as have the ruthless policies of the Sharon government. The war of words is even more intense than the physical battle. But how seriously should we take it? Part of the trouble is, if you're continuously on the hunt for anti-Semitism or other forms of racism, there's always going to be somebody who's expressing it somewhere. And the, and the real question is how widespread such feeling is. Um, and I want, to feel, I want to feel completely comfortable with the idea that it is widespread enough for us to be concerned and worried about, rather than an emanation from a very small number of extreme people. At Palestinian Media Watch, I get an answer. Their job is to monitor anti-Semitic material as shown on official Palestine TV. The words and images shown here, according to director Itamar Marcus, reveal the real message of the Palestine leadership that there can never be peace as long as Israel exists. But I asked him, wasn't he just picking on isolated examples for the sake of propaganda? We have... Uh 
10, 15, 20, 30, 100 times the amount of material uh, that we can possibly send out because it repeats over and over and over and over again. Uh, and we have it in the last few weeks, and we don't only have it from religious leaders, we have it from professors, uh, and we have it from, uh, uh, from politicians. Uh, we had one just recently, a, few, uh, a month and a half ago, from a minister in government who, who referred to the, the evil religious law of the Jews, which is what is so entrenched in them, which is why they're killing us, etc., etc. <laughs> Sermons in the mosques, MTV-style videos and even program breaks, they're all in the Media Watch archive. The music videos for children are especially popular, repeated constantly during the day. Now, here's uh, another example. Uh, we're not only evil, but we're actually cursed of God. And here, this is another religious leader. All right. So he's now linking the Holocaust, the so-called Holocaust, right. to this sin of Jews in the um, in Muhammad's day. Well, what he does here is he says, uh, we see the Jews are evil, and the Holocaust is a perfect example. The Jews created the Holocaust. Uh, and actually planned it, he says, together with the Nazi leaders in order to get sympathy of the world. It's a peculiarly kind of perverse yeah. um, uh, piece of history. Right, but what their point is that Jews are the epitome of evil. The epitome of evil incarnate in the world, and that's why they have to be destroyed. Marcus's work gives him a hotline to the Prime Minister's office. And whether or not all Palestinians take this stuff seriously, Ariel Sharon certainly does. The idea that hatred of Jews is sanctioned by the Islamic faith itself terrifies Israelis and may even affect the peace talks. I am absolutely convinced that the tremendous willingness that we've seen of suicide bombers to go out and kill vast numbers of innocent people, uh, civilians, children, babies, uh, uh, has been a direct result of the Palestinian society placing the murder of Jews as a religious obligation. That discussion with Mr. Marcus has left me profoundly depressed. That's a, a real and a genuine catalogue of things being said and preached and shown on Palestinian television, which any one of which would have a prosecution for incitement to racial hatred in Britain. Um, and even allowing for the kind of heightened sensibilities and the sense of absolute injustice uh, amongst Palestinians, you just, you're forced to ask the question, why do the Palestinian Authority leaders allow that stuff on television? Why is it there? A lot of what I'd seen at Palestinian Media Watch emanated from the Imams in Gaza, so that was the next stop. Nothing quite prepares you for this place. A unique 14-mile strip of land that's a part of the Palestinian Authority and a virtual prison camp for its 900,000 residents. The Israelis strictly control Palestinian movement in and out. My fixer on the Israel side has not been allowed to visit his sister in Gaza for 10 years. I wanted to find out what the young thought about Jews and Israel. What were they being taught about their unwanted neighbours? Oh, it's a big place. This is a private school so built with money from the Gulf states. They get more than Ofsted here. Recently, the Israeli army smashed down the doors. In the same week, a much-loved teacher was killed in a raid on armed Palestinians. Good morning, boys. Good morning, teacher. How are you today? Fine, thanks. We hope you are too. The disorder, however, ends at the classroom. You are what is life like here in Gaza? What is it like to be a 12 or 13 year old boy now in Gaza. It's very dangerous. It's, it's very, very dangerous. Why? 
because uh, every day the airplanes uh, go in, uh, in the sky and uh, sometimes they may uh, bomb some places and I'm really scared that maybe the bomb can come on me. So By accident. Do you think that every day? Yes. Yeah. Mohammed Shaaf's family had inexplicably moved to Gaza from Chesterfield. And what do they feel about the Israelis? Are they saying that because in the Quran you couldn't make an agreement with the Jews, that means the Jews can never make an agreement? Yes. Yes. Can you ask them whether they think there will be peace one day? Uh, no, not with Israelis. Impossible. Not with Israelis. There can no, be no peace with the Jews? There can't be any peace Never. with the Jews. Never. No. So how can there be peace? They don't want agreement. They, won't, they don't want peace. They were the cause of trouble in, in, in Germany, in uh, Spain, in Argentina, and in, in, in Russia, and uh, all over the world. They were. If there is a war or a coming war, the, the, the a Jew will be the one who urges the war to, to start, who breaks out the war. But the Jews were the cause of the trouble in, in Germany. In Germany. When? During the before the reign of uh, Hitler. Don't you think that? Don't you think that what happened in Germany was actually the Germans' fault? But they may make trouble in Germany. They make troubles for the Germans, so they hated them and make them make troubles for them. Hardly surprising that the Israelis complain about how history is taught. And why, for example, is there nothing in the school books about the Holocaust? Mr Zabut can tell us. He chairs the Education Committee of the Palestinian Legislative Council. From um, my point of view, that Holocaust was exaggerated from the Israeli uh, people in order to justify that why they are come to Palestine because they uh, were exposed to so and so and so. When people say that there may have been six million Jews killed in Europe in the Second World War, you think that this is not true? Not true, of course. Of course, not true. We are sure of that. In Britain, what we believe is that the Germans set up big concentration camps in which they killed hundreds of thousands of people and they killed thousands of people okay. every day in, in, the, uh, in the gas chambers. Um, do you know something different to that? We believe that they suffered, but not as they said. Yeah, the exaggerating the matter. They, we know that it, it, it was happen, it happened for them, but uh, they are, it is exaggerated. Anyhow, even if it was true, what is our responsibility for that? Why they try to, uh, to, to, to come to, the, to Palestine and to kill the Palestinian people and make deportation for the Palestinian people? Why we have to pay the price? Why? What is our relation to that? Even if they were killed, all of them, it is not our responsibility. It is the responsibility of uh, Germany and Europe. Wrong, certainly. But is it such an impossible view to understand? Especially here in Gaza, where incursions by the Israeli Defence Force regularly leave a toll of bereavement and damage. It's the kind of place where you can believe nothing and anything. Gaza is the stronghold of Hamas, the Islamist organisation which opposes the existence of the Israeli state, opposes the roadmap to peace and is a major sponsor of suicide bombings. Their political spokesman is the dour but likeable Aziz Rantisi. I was here to ask him about the Hamas Covenant, which claims that there's a Zionist plot to establish a mega Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates. And what's cited in the Covenant as proof? Our old friend, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, this document has been uh, uh, published, uh, I, I think, in Russia and uh, uh, discovered the uh, plans of uh, Jewish against not only Muslims but Christians and uh, the humanity. Does it matter to you that this document is widely believed in Europe to be a forgery? That it was created by a member of the Russian Secret Service in about 1905, 1906? I was uh, hesitated to accept that document, but when we look 
what is going on here in Palestine, we can't say uh, it's uh, not uh, prepared from the Jewish themselves. On the long walk back through no man's land, I reflected. There was a staggering level of naivety. People who knew nothing of European history and its lessons. Then there was the bitterness and misery of endless conflict. If conditions were different, I wondered, would we get such extreme manifestations of hatred? They are a little different here in Ramallah, on the West Bank, where Yasser Arafat built his headquarters. Normal life of a sort goes on, and outside the madness of Gaza, moderate voices can make themselves heard. A good place, then, to seek justification for the pictures of hate I'd seen at Palestinian Media Watch. When incitement to hatred is officially outlawed here, what on earth is it doing on Palestinian TV? Do you think that maybe such sermons should not be shown on official television? I think that uh, uh, at a time when Israel is occupying the Palestinian territories and uh, doing this daily massive killing of Palestinians, uh, I think that it's very difficult to blame the Palestinians no matter what they would say vis-à-vis -vis the Israelis. The proposition I suppose was that maybe circumstances had, and the last few years of anger and hatred had begun to create a sort of a, a change in the way in which peoples were describing each other. No, I am still uh, saying that most of this is out of hostility rather than racism. If there is a just peace, is it your view that images like that will simply disappear? I am sure that uh, this kind of hostile uh, descriptions will uh, end if the Israeli occupation on the Palestinian people will end. But if Mr. Khatib is right about Palestine, how does that explain why there's so much anti-Semitism in the wider Arab world? The largest Arab state is Egypt. If you'd been there last year, you might have seen this, a TV drama series featuring the protocols of the elders of Zion. Just watch, if you will, a bit of this, an epic TV drama shown across the Middle East. It's called Horseman Without a Horse. It tells the story of the Arab fight against colonialism, set against the backdrop of a diabolical Zionist plot to establish world domination. Large chunks of the series featured the protocols of the elders of Zion. The same protocols forged in the 1900s, approved of by Hitler and quoted in the Hamas Covenant. The 41-part series caused a major uproar in Israel and America and was the reason I came to Egypt. It was made here. And now, no one was available to talk about it. During my trip to Cairo, I was accompanied at all times by two armed security guards and the affable Amin Muntaz of the government press office. All requests for interviews went through him. And Mohamed Soubi, the series producer and star, was, I was told, too busy. Anti-Semitism, Amin would later tell me, is a very sensitive matter. What was interesting was the identity of the one man prepared to talk seriously about Egyptian anti-Semitism. Chief political advisor and right-hand man to President Hosni Mubarak, Usma Albaz. Just after the start of the Horseman series, he asked and got the President's permission to write a series of articles condemning Arab anti-Semitism. Why did you feel it necessary to write those articles? Uh, because I felt that uh, the Arab-Israeli dispute caused a certain distortion in the minds of many people, both Arabs and Israelis, about uh, each other. And uh, because the Arabs were innocent about uh, what happened to the Jewish people in Europe, about the Nazi policies, the Nazi policies about the Holocaust, I thought it was my duty to inform our people that uh, this, uh, that we should not have borrowed that chapter, that leaf from the uh, um, uh, European history because we had nothing to do with it. Uh, that was alien to our culture, alien to our history, heritage. And for us to come, accept it, adopt it as if it is our own is despicable because it will portray the negative image 
that our dispute with Israel is uh, driven basically by some uh, a certain degree of anti-Semitism. Thinking about it, it seems to me that the Egyptian government is now making a very big effort to sort of row back from the substantial amount of anti-Semitism contained within the Egyptian press. When somebody as authoritative and as central as Osama al-Baz writes significant articles and gives significant interviews worrying about what's happening and suggesting that actually people be more rational, discuss these things in a more proper and thoughtful way, I think it's a, a recognition, I think it must be a recognition actually, of the, of the harm that's done to the Egyptian and the Arab cause in the West by its association with such overt anti-Semitism. But Arab governments have turned one face towards us and another to the Arab street, where opinion fed with articles and cartoons is less sophisticated. Much less sophisticated. Outside the ministries, the protocols are widely available. Holocaust denial is common, and even the blood libel lives on. Now there's a new film planned to succeed Horseman Without a Horse. It's linked to the story in this book, The Martyrs of Zion by, as it happens, the Syrian Defence Minister Mustafa Tlas. The book is a repetition of the notorious Damascus blood libel of 1840. In that year, Jews, including a David Harari, were charged with murdering a kindly Christian priest, Father Toma, and mixing his blood with the Passover biscuits or matzahs. But the film's producer, Munir Radi, says his version is different. It's about harmony between religions, and it will be Egypt's answer to Schindler's List. <laughs> أو ال أو جهة ما قامت بعمله أنا ب بقول إن أنا في سبيل عمل فيلم عن الفلسطينيين وسميته قائمة هراري ما المقصود بقائمة هراري قائمة هراري هو عبارة عن في سنة 1840 في المدينة القديمة في دمشق وهم إنجليز مش كده as he told his story, it dawned on me what Raddy was saying. While he claimed his film was nothing to do with the disgusting Damascus blood libel, it shared the same characters, the same wicked Jew Harari who murders the same innocent priest. But his story had mutated into a piece of pseudo-history. <laughs> اليهود الموجودين في دمشق القديمة ورحلهم إلى فلسطين أرض فلسطين أنا بقول إنه دي دي إن في, في هذه الفترة هي كانت بداية التفكير في الدولة الإسرائيلية بداية التفكير يعني الخطوة أو الخلية الأولى لتكوين الدولة الإسرائيلية في فلسطين Radi's story is the blood libel, but he's exchanged the Jews who kill for blood with the Zionists who kill for Palestine. Actually, there were no Zionists in 1840. Even so, I question whether this is the same kind of murderous racism that fueled European anti-Semitism. In the Middle East, I found a confused hatred for Jews that was usually linked to the battle over Palestine. And in Tel Aviv, I found an echo to my questions. At the university, Esther Webman showed me some of their Nazi memorabilia. Some of the same anti-Semitic imagery is now evident in the Arab world. But does it mean the same? When I put this to Esther, I get a surprising answer. I constantly debate with myself whether uh, this Islamic or, 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 let's, or Arab anti-Semitism uh, is really racist or it's... Or, or, is driven by racism. 
Um, and I'm still debating with myself because I see it mainly on political grounds. But when they talk about the protocols or they use even the, um, uh, the blood libel, uh, or they even compare Zionism with Nazism, I am not absolutely sure that every or each one of those who use that I fully understand the connotation and the context of, uh, of the terms. And that's why I have my own debate and I'm trying all the time to assess whether it is anti-Semitic uh, in the way anti-Semitism is known in the West or it is a different kind of anti-Semitism. Esther's is an honest ambivalence and it suggests both hope and fear. Hope in that the message of the prophet is not inevitably anti-Semitic. When Islam offered a place to Jews in Arab lands, Christians were slaughtering or expelling them. Were the Palestinian issue to be resolved, then the present hatred might die away. Fear because it may already have gone too far, filling young minds with the idea that there can be no peace with those people. Anti-Semitism alienates young secular Israelis and drives young Muslims to this. A suicide bomb in a beach cafe that leaves a French waitress and a Muslim boy from Hounslow dead. These are the words of Basmala, aged three and a half. And these are the words of Hamas suicide bomber Mahmoud Mamash, age 21. Terrible words from a terrible old hatred.